In this episode, our initial impressions of the Zoom F6 audio recorder. First of all, this is a pre-production copy of the Zoom F6, which Zoom was kind enough to lend to me for about two days. So this is just going to be an initial impressions. It is not a full review, and the firmware is not finalized yet. I am told that the audio quality is final, so we can take a closer listen and look at that. Now, those that aren't really audio geeks, let me just explain at a very high level what's innovative about the Zoom F6. And if you're interested in sticking around for the details, that's great. If not, that's fine as well. So the big thing on the Zoom F6 is that it can record a much wider dynamic range of sound. And it's roughly equivalent, for those of you that are more into cameras, to raw recording. It's not a perfect analogy, but if you're trying to understand what this is all about, that's the general idea. So we're going to cover two things. Number one, we're going to take a closer look at the audio quality and what this whole dual analog to digital converter and 32-bit float recording does for us in practical terms. And then we'll also take a more general look at the overall hardware, its overall functionality, and even look at ergonomics and build quality. One of the challenges traditionally with recording audio is that you can run into cases where as you set the amplification, the gain or gain trim or input level, depending on the device you're using, if you set that too high and then your sound source gets too loud, you can run into digital clipping or distorting. It does not sound good, and there's not a good way to recover from that in post. So to explain this, let me talk about typical recorders. First of all, a typical recorder has a preamplifier, which takes the audio signal from a microphone and amplifies that audio signal up to what's called line level. Then there's an analog to digital converter that takes that analog signal and converts it to ones and zeros, which is then recorded to some sort of media, whether that be an SD card, compact flash card, SSD drive, whatever. Now on consumer level devices, you're kind of on your own. There's really nothing there to protect you. You have to do gain staging. You have to set your gain or amplification level correctly so that if your sound source gets suddenly loud, you'll still have enough headroom and that won't clip and distort up against zero dB. Prosumer and professional level devices, traditionally there have been a couple of different ways for dealing with these potential overloads and these clipping incidents. And that is using something called a limiter. And there are a couple of different approaches to that. The first type is an analog limiter. This is typically going to be in your higher end gear. It's not gonna be found a whole lot in consumer grade gear or even prosumer grade gear, but there are a few exceptions. What an analog limiter does is as the audio comes into the preamplifier and is amplified, that analog limiter will catch cases where it's getting too loud and it will actually quickly pull that level down or attenuate it before the signal gets to the analog to digital converter. So that can potentially save cases of clipping and distorting which then get converted into digital and become permanent at that point. Now, analog limiters have the advantage of doing that processing before you get to the analog to digital converter. They're not perfect though. If you set your gain too high and the audio is constantly hitting up against that limiter, you're gonna get this sort of pumping sound, which isn't great either. So they're extraordinarily useful tools, these analog limiters. They're not perfect, but they work pretty well. The second type of limiter is a digital limiter, and this comes in a variety of different forms. Typically, these are done after the analog to digital converter. So the way the Zoom F-Series have worked with their advanced hybrid look-ahead limiters is that when you set your input gain trim level, say, for example, to 60 dB of gain, it's actually only applying 50 decibels of gain. The audio is then brought into the analog to digital converter, and after that, it evaluates each individual sample each moment in time and determines, okay, is there enough headroom to increase that 10 decibels back that we originally had the gain set to, or is there not? If there is, go ahead and raise it by 10 dB. If there's not, then it doesn't. It essentially gave you an additional 10 decibels of headroom. So that worked pretty nicely. The only problem with that approach is that it does raise the noise floor potentially by about 10 dB. Now the Zoom F series has extraordinarily high quality preamplifiers. So adding that 10 dB back wasn't generally a problem, but every little bit can count. So that's where the Zoom F6 is really, really interesting in its approach. It essentially makes limiters irrelevant and unnecessary. How does it do that? Well, it works a little differently. So there's a preamplifier and it applies a unity gain. It is sort of an optimized gain for the preamplifier design. You don't get to set the gain on the Zoom F6. It is actually set hard-coded by the recorder, but that's not a problem necessarily because the Zoom F6 has dual analog to digital converters. One of those converters will take the higher amplitude, the louder sounds, 
and do the conversion on those. So that's going to be the shouting and the explosions and things of that nature. And the second converter will handle the lower amplitude sounds, the quieter sounds, the whispers and things of that nature. And then it combines those two together. So instead of having a case where you have a single analog to digital converter trying to manage everything, you now have two which can represent a much larger dynamic range. So it's taking all of that additional dynamic range and recording it to a file format that's capable of capturing that entire range. What does this mean in practical terms? It means that it's gonna be very difficult to clip and distort your audio because you have the gain set too high. And you're not gonna to need to rely on limiters to save you in those circumstances. It also means that your noise floor is going to stay nice and low in the mix. So it's actually a really, really interesting approach. And let's see how it works in practical terms. Here we have an audio file that was recorded on the Zoom F6. And we have a couple of things that look a little odd here. First of all, at this point, this is a 32-bit float recording. In this portion here, we have the fader set to 0 dB. Then in this next section, we change the fader to minus 60 dB. And then in this section right here, we set the fader to plus 60 dB. And then we moved it back here to 0 dB. So you might think to yourself, well, this is a mess. <laughs> How is this good? Well, let me show you a few things here first. When I set it to plus 60 dB, it looks like it's completely clipped and distorted. And if you don't know what that sounds like, here's a little playback for you. I now have the fader set to plus 60. The, let's see, the line out is clipping. Pretty horrible. But watch what happens when we pull this down in terms of amplitude. Just pull it down. Okay, so that first section where we were not yelling, we were just talking, that's back in kind of the stratosphere again. And then from this point on, we were yelling. Let's pull that back in. Okay. Let's play that back for you now. I now have the fader set to plus 60. The, let's see, the line out is clipping and the left right is showing all the way at the top, but it doesn't show a clip symbol because in theory, this should not be clippable. <laughs> Let's go ahead and try to clip it. Check, one, two, three. Trying to clip the Zoom F6. No clipping, amazing. So let's see, what about this other stuff here? This is at zero dB. Let's bring this up. That's at 15 decibels, 30 decibels. About 38 decibels there. Play a little section there for you. And I have the, um, we're recording in 32-bit mode, so we're using the dual analog to digital converters. Sounds pretty good. Let's take this section that was recorded at minus 60 dB, and let's pull that up. So we're gonna pull it up 15 decibels, 30 decibels, 45, 60, we caught the edge there of the other section, so I'm gonna pull back. 65, 80, 88 decibels there. Play that back for you. The fader is now set to minus 60, and uh, I'm showing absolutely no levels on the recorder at all. Now let's bump it up. Okay, and let's measure this silent portion here, if you will. This would normally be very, very noisy. If you actually did that with the 24-bit recording, this would be horribly noisy, but you can see here it's sitting at about minus 70 dB. So the noise floor is extraordinarily good. And uh, you can see here on those sections that where we were clipping to, or we thought we might clip, but we actually didn't clip, <laughs> those are sitting at minus 87. So extraordinarily clean recordings. And you can see here that you don't have to worry about clipping for the most part. The microphone that you're using is much more likely to distort before the preamplifiers and analog to digital converters on the F6 will. Now let's take a look at the features of the Zoom F6. So first of all, we have six locking Neutrik XLR inputs, and it is actually a 14 track recorder. The way this works is you can record each of the individual inputs to separate channels. And 
you can also record those same six channels a second time in 24-bit. So you, the first six are 32-bit, second six are 24-bit, and then the last two tracks are a stereo mix of the six inputs. The XLR inputs are mic line switchable. They also supply 48 or 24 volts phantom power. And when you are working in 24-bit mode, they can supply up to 75 decibels of gain with a 3000 ohm impedance output. So these are very, very good preamplifiers. New on the Zoom F6 relative to the other Zoom F series is there is a USB-C port. This is for external power. It's for using the F6 as an audio interface, and it also connects the F-Control control surface. There's a pre-record feature for up to six seconds of pre-record. So when you press the button, the six seconds prior to the time you press the button are also recorded with your recording. You can record 32-bit float files up to 96 kilohertz or 24-bit files up to 192 kilohertz. There is a 3.5 millimeter unbalanced line output. This runs at minus 10 dBV. So this is a consumer line level, perfect for sending audio to something like a DSLR or mirrorless camera. There is also this proprietary port for a Bluetooth adapter, which allows you to then run an iOS app to control the F6. There are a variety of powering options. So within the unit itself, you can place four different AA batteries, which fit into this plastic sled, which then fit behind a metal door with a thumb screw. But there is also this built-in battery sled for Sony L-series type batteries, commonly known as Sony NPF style batteries. And of course, as mentioned before, you can also power via USB-C. Now, of course, the power time will vary by different battery types. What I found was this, with this small NPF 550 battery, we were able to power for easily about three hours. So that worked out really nicely. So you can also buy those in much larger capacities if you need to do that. And you can hook up all three of these types of batteries together to power you through an entire production day. Behind the NPF battery sled, there is an SD card slot. It takes SDXC cards, so that means you can use cards up to 512 gigabytes in size. Over on the right-hand side here, there is a headphone volume dial, a 3.5 millimeter headphone jack. Now, this appears to be the same headphone amplifier that we've seen on the other Zoom F-Series. In this case, however, it is using a 3.5 millimeter jack instead of a quarter inch jack. On the bottom, there's a quarter 20 tap to attach this to a tripod or a camera rig. There is also a camera bracket that will fit on top so you can mount your camera up on top of the F6. I don't know if that's gonna be included or it's going to be an optional accessory. I would assume it's gonna be an optional accessory. Just like the previous Zoom F-Series recorders like the F4, F8, F8N, you can use the F-Control control surface to work with your recorder. This makes it a lot easier when you're working at a table or a desk or a cart to be able to manage all the settings. You have linear faders and just makes it a really nice unit to work with because it is a little bit on the cramped side when you're working with just the F6 on its own. Didn't have a chance to look at some of these features yet, but there is also ambisonic recording and auto mix. So if you're recording sort of a panel discussion, for example, you can connect all the mics and it will actually automatically attenuate the mics of the people who aren't currently speaking. So you get a cleaner mix overall. Just like on the Zoom F4 and F8 series, there is the same temperature compensated crystal oscillator timecode clock built within the unit. So that means you have a built-in timecode generator. And I found the timecode generator in the F4 and the F8 to work really, really nicely, hold their time very tightly over the course of an entire production day. So very, very usable. I did also notice that there was a timecode option under the Bluetooth menu, which looked kind of interesting. I have no idea what it does. Looking forward to see what that does in the final version. So it does appear to be the same headphone amplifier we saw in the Zoom F4, F8, and F8n, and it also has the additional digital processing that was added in the Zoom F8. Of course, you can use the F6 as an audio interface with your computer as well, or an iPad, and you do this via USB. You can record to stereo or multi-track, if you're working on Windows, you will require a driver to do multi-track. On Mac OS, it works without a driver. And as a bonus, you can record to the SD card internally on the F6 at the same time that you're using it as an audio interface to record to your computer or iPad. Now, one of the things that I think people noticed initially is that this is a very, very small recorder. In terms of size and weight, here are the specs. We're looking at something that's just barely over a pound in terms of its overall weight. It is tiny based on what you get. So you have six XLR microphone inputs, and this is the smallest recorder with that many inputs that I've ever seen. So it looks to me like Zoom was trying to accomplish a couple of different things here at the same time. So number one, of course, we have this amazing new audio signal chain that has the dual analog to digital converters, and it records the 32-bit float. We've already seen what that can do for us. But at the same time, they were trying to make a new form factor, I think, that was very, very small. So if you've got to fit this recorder into the tiniest of spaces, or maybe you have a bad back and you're gonna be operating from a sound bag, this might be a good option from the standpoint that it's very small 
and it makes it easy to carry around very little weight if you're going to do an entire production day. Of course, whenever you miniaturize things that much, there are some trade-offs in terms of ergonomics, and let's talk about those. So the controls are pretty small. These knobs here are each the channel knobs. They do not act as buttons, they are merely knobs, but if you run them all the way to the left, they actually click that channel off, put that channel into mute, and disarm it. Instead of having a menu encoder knob and a headphone volume knob on the front, like on the Zoom F4 and the F8 and the F8N, you now have a headphone volume dial on the right-hand side, which is a little bit more difficult to reach when you're operating from a bag, but it's not quite as bad as the knob on the Mix Pre series, so <laughs> it's probably a little better operating this from the back because you can slide your finger in and just move it back and forth to adjust the volume level. But again, ideally I'd like to have that up on front. With this form factor, there just wasn't room. Now since there's no menu encoder knob, instead you use these four buttons to navigate the menus. This is not as ideal as the knob. I really, really like the knob on the Zoom F4 and F8 series. This is not quite as efficient, but it still gets the job done. The buttons are okay. Um, not my favorite, but again, with this tiny little form factor, it's kind of one of the trade-offs. The screen is actually quite nice. It's a huge improvement over the Zoom F4, and it's a little bit smaller than the screen on the Zoom F8. So it looks very much like the screen on the Zoom F8, except smaller. It's about 1.5 inches diagonally. It's basically square in terms of its orientation. There are backlit play and record buttons, just like on the other Zoom F series. Interestingly, both Zoom and KTEC are working on bags for this particular mixer, so that'll be interesting to see how well it works once you get it into a bag. These are custom made for the F6, so it'll be interesting to see how they work out. What's going to be really appealing about them is that they're tiny, and so you're not carrying around nearly as much weight, and I think you can basically just wear a belt to hold that bag against your body. You won't even need the whole harness because it's so lightweight. And then on the back you have these massive belt loops with rubber feet. So when you place it down on a flat surface, it grips and it stays in place, or you can attach it to a belt if you wanted to do that. I would think that putting on a belt very close to your body would make it a little bit more difficult to work with, but if you're in a pinch, that'll work. In terms of build quality, we're talking about the typical Zoom F-Series rugged build quality. So that's very good, incredibly rugged body made out of solid aluminum. There are plastic knobs and buttons that seem reasonably well made. And there are screws on top for the bracket like we talked about before. So overall, there's an initial look at the Zoom F6. Let me just say a couple things about it. Number one, I have pre-ordered one. I am going to buy one. I, actually, I already have put my money down, so they have my money. <laughs> I'm very excited about the technology they put in this, especially the dual analog to digital converters and the 32-bit float recording. That's a really nice step forward. And it's really nice to see Zoom innovate in ways that kind of move things forward and kind of make certain other technologies irrelevant. So for example, limiters basically are not necessary anymore with this type of recorder. Now, I wanna be careful to say, Zoom is not the first company to do dual analog to digital converters. There have been other companies that have done that before. I think they're the first ones to combine those dual analog to digital converters with 32-bit float recording. So it's an interesting step forward. I'm excited about it. Ergonomically, it's not my number one choice, but I think it'll work really well when I'm working from a cart and I can use the Zoom F control. I'd be more inclined to do that <laughs> for a lot of my corporate work where I can be working from a cart or a desk and I don't need to worry as much about ha having things in a bag. I think it would be a really good option for people that have back trouble and are gonna be doing bag type of sound recording work. So rather than carry around a much heavier, larger mixer, you can make the sacrifice and you can say, okay, I want something that's lighter. That's number one priority for me and I can live with the fairly cramped controls on the front of the unit. The powering options look pretty good as well with the USB-C, Sony MPF style batteries, and AA batteries, so you have a lot of options there. And it looks like you should be able to power this through an entire production day with a variety of different options, so that looks good too. I will miss the Hiroshi input. I do like that for when I'm working in a sound bag because then I can attach my battery distribution system to the unit. But again, because they're trying to make the unit so small, that's one of the things that got sacrificed. And I'll have to see. I, if I get the dedicated bag for it, I think it'd be interesting to see ergonomically how well it ends up working on a shoot day. So once it starts shipping in July, we will be back with another review for you in depth on a couple of things that we weren't able to really dig into here. I hope that was helpful for you. If you have any questions, go ahead and leave those down below. And if you've not already subscribed, make sure you do that. And we'll be sure to get you more great videos on how to improve your lighting and sound for video. Talk to you soon. Mm -hmm.